Thank you for kind introduction. My name is Mimura. This time, it is my great privilege, and I am extraordinarily happy to receive the glorious Kyoto Prize as one of the research people for semiconductor device. HEMT, High Electromobility Transistor, was announced 40 years ago, and this was the citation for Kyoto Prize. During the last 40 years, HEMT has been widely applied to information communication technology, including the satellite broadcasting receivers or mobile phone system. I would like to show you the animation to overview HEMT first, and then let me state my own memory in childhood and the background for the invention of HEMT. Now, I hope you will enjoy the animation first. An invention from 40 years ago is playing a key role in today's information and communication technology. Electrons move at high speed in a semiconductor. This innovative transistor is a HEMT. The device was invented in 1979 by Fujitsu, who also succeeded in verifying its superb performance for the first time in the world. HEMT stands for High Electron Mobility Transistor. It was announced to the world in 1980. In order to create a new transistor, it was necessary to create a new path for electrons. A path for them to move smoothly at high speeds in the transistor. It's like an exclusive lane for electrons. In the past, the fastest transistor was a gallium arsenide transistor. However, the speed of electrons slowed down in the path as they are disturbed by a lot of donor impurities. In the HEMT, we were able to accelerate the electron mobility by creating an exclusive lane with almost no impurities. As a result, electron mobility was significantly improved compared with ordinary transistors. Let's take a look at how HEMTs work through some diagrams. Electrons move from source to drain, passing under the gate on the way. The speed of a transistor is determined by how quickly the electrons travel under the gate. However, in past transistors, electrons bumped into donor impurities along the way and their speed slowed down. In the HEMT, a layer of gallium arsenide that has almost no impurities is generated. And on top of it, a layer of aluminum gallium arsenide that includes donor impurities is grown. In this structure, electrons leave the aluminum gallium arsenide layer and collect in the impurity-free gallium arsenide layer below. This creates a layer of two-dimensional electron gas. When voltage is applied to it, Electrons move in the path at high speed without bumping into impurities. Next, let's take a look at how HEMTs work by discussing energy bands. Every semiconductor material has its own energy band structure. When a layer of aluminum gallium arsenide and a layer of gallium arsenide are connected, the electrons move to the gallium arsenide layer as it pulls electrons stronger than the aluminum gallium arsenide. This creates an exclusive lane for the electrons. This lane, or two-dimensional electron gas, allows HEMTs to operate at high speed with very little energy loss. However, producing this two-dimensional electron gas requires high-precision crystal growth technology. One such technology is molecular beam epitaxy. For example, the thickness of a crystal layer of aluminum gallium arsenide that serves as the HEMT's electron supply layer is only 30 nanometers. A molecular beam epitaxial system controls the thickness of this layer to be equal and prevents the material from mixing with the materials in layers above and below. To semiconductor material, gallium nitride, 
that allows HEMTS to operate with 10 times the number of electrons and voltage of gallium arsenide transistors. From parabolic antennas to car navigation systems, radar detectors, and mobile phone base station systems, HEMTS are incorporated in a range of devices that are needed for information and communication systems. They are also key components of radio telescopes searching for new interstellar molecules, making HEMTS crucial to scientific advancement. HEMTS are expected to continue playing an important role in our society. Thank you. So that was the introduction of overview of HEM. This chart describes the major system of HEM application. Mainly today, HEM has been used for wireless systems. Now let me review my childhood days. Let me start talking to you on my father and mother. My father was a designer of the ladies' garments working for the department store in Osaka. In National Registry, I was born in Osaka in December 1944. However, that was the end stage of the World War II. An air attack to the major cities in Japan was getting so fierce. Therefore, my mother was evacuated to the Okayama prefecture, and I was born there. Before I was born, my eldest brother just passed away. My parents were so sad and disappointed. Therefore, when I was born, I was regarded as the rebirth of my late elder brother. I was raised with full of love and affections with parents. And after the war, we moved to Kobe, and I have a memory of Shinkaichi downtown in Kobe. A lot of movie theaters were built. I enjoyed the movie watching with different genres, and I was fond of scientific fiction film produced by America. That was the total color picture. I think that was the catchphrase. It was amazing beauty when I first watched the color image. I forgot the theme of one film, but the lava was completely red in river. I was overwhelmed with the sound effect and the vivid color. I know that it was the movie. However, I was so much worried about the real fire might be broken out in the theater. It was a mystery how we can make a colored image. I watched too many scientific fiction films produced by America. When I read graduation essays in later days, I was surprised to see my own essay that I said, I want to be a scientist. My father let me decide and do what I want to do as a career. My mother was basically the same. She collected the necessary information to children from teachers or friends. Their principle is do whatever you want to do. I have been appreciating their generous support. My life as a child was so happy once. I have a fond of memories in my own family. At the university, I went to the Kansei Gakuin University in the Department of Science for Physics. Professor Hori was the physics professor. He showed experiments in front of our eyes. I was quite impressed with that. This was the unique style in Japan. Dr. Hori went to Europe in Copenhagen at the Niels Bohr Research Institute for the quantum mechanics research. Then he often went to the University of Tübingen in Germany. He watched the teaching style of the experiments there. Kepler, world-famous astronomer, 
and Hegel, great philosopher, were from University of Tübingen. This type of giving classes were not only giving the knowledge to the students, but also methodology of the science or scientific spirit were educated to the young pupils. It was very meaningful style of teaching. For the graduation research in Dr. Hori's laboratory, I selected the optical rotation as a phenomena to be researched. This is the picture taken with Professor Hori and the lab members in 1966. I was supposed to go up to the graduate school at the Kwansei Gakuin, however, Professor Hori soon retired, therefore I moved to Osaka University for the research lab of the semiconductor optical physics department. And 50 years ago, I encountered the transistor. At Osaka University, my teacher was Professor Narita, and I joined the Fujitsu in Kobe in 1970 because Professor Narita recommended Professor Narita used to work for the Kobe Industry Inc., which later merged with Fujitsu. He was involved in the domestic transistor research for the first time in Japan together with Dr. Azizumi. So he launched the research for the semiconductor electronics in Japan. But when I joined his laboratory, research focus was shifted to the compound semiconductor crystal function and optic properties. At Fujitsu, I heard that I was supposed to be assigned to the optical properties for semiconductor research. However, I was assigned actually to the Department of Development of the Transistor. After joining that department, General Manager Dr. Mayakawa gave us the explanation for transistor. You know, transistor has the two layers of PN junction back to back. That was the clear-cut recollection in my mind. But I didn't know at all what the PN junction is. And operating principle of the transistor has totally unknown to me. I couldn't understand it. And I said to my senior, I confess that. And then you should read this. That was thesis written by the Dr. Shokre for PN junction theory, who invented the PN junction transistor. I was amazed and shocked to see how, in simple way, the rectification is analyzed in the PN junction in the thesis. And I started to join the training at the company and my seniors guided the juniors, and the transistor was able to be operated with their guidance. I was very much surprised to see the precision of the production engineering level of the semiconductor device in Japan, because all the current and voltage were reproduced as textbook sets. One or two years later, after I joined the company, I wanted to create my own devices. I was too young, I was thoughtless, because I thought I could do it. But all the products I produced were just debris, dead bodies, and my curiosity, however, increased towards the new device. In retrospect, all the seniors gave us the encouragement for the new challenges. That was the climate in the uh, department. In 1975, I was moved to Kawasaki City to the research institute of the Fujitsu. Now I got involved in the development of high-speed electron device from the silicon to the compound. I made a change. In 1948, at the U.S. Bell Research Institute, PN junction transistor was invented. Since then, important technical challenge is the high-speed transistor. 
If we can get a high speed, huge volume of information can be processed in short time, and then the high frequency signal can be received or transmitted. Then dramatic system performance can be expected to be elevated. So therefore, let me explain the basic mechanism which controls the speed of the transistor. We have various types of transistors, but this is the most popular one, FET, field effect transistor. FET can adjust the total numbers of electrons underneath the gate by applied voltage. Then we can change the drain current. Required time for the change of numbers of electrons is depending upon the traveling time for electrons to travel underneath the gate electrode. If we can shorten the traveling time, then transistor can operate with high speed. Therefore, there are two methods to accelerate the speed. One is to miniature the gate electrode, this distance should be shortened. Another method is to speed up the traveling time of electron. Traveling speed of electron can correlate with the intensity of the electric field, that's Ohm's law. Coefficient constant is called mobility. Mobility of electron can be varied according to the kinds of semiconductor. Gallium arsenide has five times higher mobility compared with silicon. Therefore, gallium arsenide FET was actively researched from the beginning of 1970s. In 1979, when I invented HEMT, I worked in the workplace to develop gallium arsenide FET. This is FET, what we call gallium arsenide MESPET, one type of FET. Voltage applied to the gate electrode, and then currency can be changed for operation. In this state, no electricity is running, but if apply the positive gate voltage, then gate is open. As if gate is open, current will start to run. In 1966, C.A. Mead invented the said MESPET, and for the device development people, this is the ultimate product. Probably only the improvement is the remaining work. That was the then interpretation. Therefore, different from the MESPET, the gallium arsenide MOSFET, that is metal oxide smithfield FET, was the research challenge that we made a start since 1977. As you know, MOSFET is the essential device for the silicon large scale in IC. We wanted to see the potential of the gallium arsenide MOSFET with the high speed compared with the silicon MOSFET. For silicon MOSFET, with the gate electrode on the oxide of film on the gate, we can induce electron on the surface of silicon. However, we could not induce the electrons on the surface of gallium arsenide as we could for the silicon. No researcher had made success, so it's unprecedented challenge. We repeated experiments making different kinds of the gate oxide Film. However, to the end, we couldn't induce the electron. On the surface of the silicon, if only we can form the SiO2 film, electron can be invited, but no way for gallium arsenide. On the gallium arsenide, the oxide film, we see the surface level on the interface that traps the electrons. Therefore, electron cannot move anymore. Even though we worked hard 
to remove this surface level. We couldn't get rid of it. One year later, in 1978, I was disappointed that I strongly believed that we ran out of the idea. I got depleted. And I decided to give it up. That was a great setback. But after giving it up, still, I wanted to show some of the results of the switching performance with the MOSFET, with the current channel, with the donor doping. MOSFET with the targeted electron accumulation layer is desperate, but before closing the curtain, we wanted to show some function with the doping material, and I selected the conference, what we call DRC, Device Research Conference, in 1979 to close the curtain for my research. I was preparing the paper for that purpose, and then I happened to meet the thesis titled on the modulation of super lattice around February back in 1979. What is the modulation doped super lattice? That is high purity gallium arsenide. This is the one is sandwiched with the silicon doped N-type aluminum gallium arsenide. This one, blue one, two thin layers of semiconductors are alternatingly stacked up for tens of twenties of layers. Electron mobility in the super lattice is the contents of the theme. But authors didn't refer to any of the facts. However, it attracted my eyes. Because if we look at it, this portion, three layers out of tens of layers, then gallium arsenide between the two N-type aluminum gallium arsenides there are accumulation of electrons. For super lattice researchers, that was regarded as taken for granted. However, for gallium arsenide, we were struggling with the elimination of the surface level. It was a fresh surprise, amazing surprise, quite impressive because we couldn't accumulate electron on the gallium arsenide MOSFET because of the surface level. But in modulation doped super lattice, gallium arsenide, aluminum gallium arsenide is used, but crystal structures are quite similar. Therefore, on the interface, electron can be accumulated because of less level of the surface. This is impressive, but this is the phenomena in the special type of device of modulation doped super lattice. Therefore, I didn't come up with any of the specific ideas or inspiration at that time. But human psychology can change abruptly. At the DRC, as I mentioned, I made the last presentation of the Gallium Arsenal and MOSFET, and then at the reception, I had enjoyed the chatting with the US researchers. And then all of a sudden, an idea came up in my mind. I could induce some practical device from the modulation doped super lattice. That means a strong willpower, motivation, all of a sudden emerged from the bottom of my heart. That was June 25th, 1979, encountering the paper for the different field of technology, chatting over a drink in the reception with other researchers. And I think the biggest factor was the bitter experience of sense of failure with the Gary Masson and MOSFET. Sensitivity for the other things could be sharpened with the failures. From the day-to-day -day chances, we can pick up the new learning thanks to this enhanced sensitivity. Louis Pasteur said that chance can visit only 
prepared mind. In the case of Hemet, prepared mind was raised with the failures of the gallium arsenide MOSFET. After the 37th DRC, I really concentrated on the super lattice structure to gain some creative ideas and reached a certain conclusion, uh, which was the simple structure would be the best. So, if so, the simplest structure would be an electron accumulation layer the made from high-purity gallium arsenide layer and an n-type aluminum gallium arsenide layer serving as an electron channel. So the next challenge was how to control electrons in a modulation doped super lattice. I kept thinking for two or three weeks uh, to gain this idea, and that was in July 1979. I got an idea of Hemd, finally. The principle of Hemd is explained in this handwritten energy band diagram. The diagram was part of the patent application document submitted to the corporate legal department in August 1979. It explains layer structure of, of the hemp and how to control electron accumulation layer to operate a transistor. But I admit that it is a bit too abstract. I should have made it more concrete. So now I will explain a bit more about the roots or origin of hemp device structure. So again, as you can see, the gallium arsenide and the gallium arsenide MOSFET. So these are just like jigsaw puzzle, gallium arsenide MOSFET and the gallium arsenide MOSFET. So these pieces are put together just like to complete jigsaw puzzle to develop the hemp. So perhaps it would be the same for any creative field. If you try to create a novel idea, you have to expand the scope of research area. The Hemt invention proved to be a very good example. Another thing I would like to emphasize is the failed gallium arsenide MOSFET, but still an indispensable piece to complete the HEM device concept. It was a very important learning for me. I realize that the failure experience would be still a useful experience. That's but I learned from Hemt development process. In August 1979, Hemt idea was accepted by Fuji to legal department for patent applications. But if we had just an idea, it is like a pie in the sky. The idea needs proof. But to prove or to do experiments, you need many technologies. To produce hemmed prototypes, advanced crystal development technology was required. I worked with the device development uh, department at that time, but our department did not have that technology. A current channel of a hemp, uh, that is, electron accumulation layer, uh, may exist in an extremely narrow space from the gallium arsenide aluminum gallium arsenide heterojunction, as small as uh, the wave function or just a dozen of atom layers. Naturally, crystal development had to be controlled very precisely. Uh, like atom level precision. So only possible technology to have that level of precision at that time was MBE, or molecular beam epitaxial growth. So that was the only possible option we could consider. MBE is basically a vacuum deposition method. 
So the crystal cells are placed in the cells and are heated to generate electron beams and heated substrate crystals are radiated. Now the beams would be, uh, would be radiated uh, to the substrate and then thin film a crystal will develop. And in front of each cell is shutter. So these are well, the we have shutters here. Uh, the opening and the closing of the shutter of the atom uh, would enable the development of crystals in a, uh, a, in a continuous uh, manner. And, but uh, fortunately, uh, at Fujitsu Laboratory 2, there are a group researching the use of MBE to develop gallium arsenide, uh, aluminum gallium arsenide. Group leader was Dr. Satoshi Hiyamizu, now Professor Emeritus of Osaka University. I went to uh, his group and explained my idea. They agreed to support in development of heterojunction crystals. And this is how we started the cross-departmental uh, small uh, prototype development project. Uh, but of course, our project was not authorized the project. Uh, it was a rather inofficial project, so it was quite a limited amount of time we could spend on this project. But perhaps three months later, after we started this project, uh, it was in November, I think, the levels of MBE technology was quite advanced, and it was quite amazing progress, and quite ready to start a device production. I think it was really uh, how passionate they were. The research team was the matter of life and death for them. And meanwhile, I was in charge of device process. Particularly challenging process was etching. An entire uh, N-type aluminum garium earthenite layer under the gate electrode had to be depleted in order to operate a hemp. Between the gate electrode and heterojunction, a thickness of semiconductor has to be controlled to uh, just a few nanometer order by etching. It was level of procedure that we could not think possible at that time, but based upon available technology. And I tried to create a various etchants and tried them on wafers. Repeating this again and again, I wasted many precision MB wafers. Uh, but uh, I think in the late December, we could find the functioning ham chips finally among wafer whose yield was still low. When I saw the birth of ham, of course I was happy and there was a sense of achievement, but also I felt a strong sense of relief that I could finally pay, repay the MB group for all their support. I made a presentation on the ham research in June 1980 at the 38th DRC held at Cornell University, New York. I finished my presentation and returned to my seat, and somebody tapped my shoulder, and I turned back. And I found a stranger holding some paper, so I looked at it and was quite surprised, because his paper described a very similar device to our hemp. So aluminum garium arsenide and the garium arsenide layers are in reverse. So it's uh, what we call reverse hemmed today. The reverse hemmed has an electron accumulation layer on top of aluminum gallium arsenide. So that, that's, that's a reverse hemmed. So we were honored as the first inventor of the hemp, but the difference between our group and the second group was only a few months. There was lots of skepticism, and I myself had some doubts in hemp's practical applications. There were two reasons. For one, MB, which was used to develop hem crystals, had the problem of low productivity. Because originally, MBE was developed for research purpose, 
not for the mass production. So it wasn't the mass production architecture. Therefore, we needed a new crystal development technique suitable for mass production. And then uh, we thought the, uh, the idea turned out to be a good solution was MOCV, or metal organic chemical vapor deposition, use, using organic metal gas as materials and suitable for mass production. Another challenge was hemmed processing technology itself. The distance between the gate electrode and heterojunction had to be precisely controlled to have exact thickness. As aluminum garium arsenide contains aluminum, compared to garium arsenide, it is more chemically reactive, so just exposed to the atmosphere, aluminum oxide oxidation film develops naturally. As a result, aluminum garium arsenide film sickness fractured, and this was a final stumbling block in application development. The breakthrough to this problem was garium arsenide cap layer stuck on aluminum garium arsenide layer and the protection layer and the reactive iron etching technology. The garium arsenide cap layer protects the surface of aluminum garium arsenide from oxidation, and only when control electrode is introduced, the exact area of the cap layer for the electrode can be selectively, selectively etched. So quite a straightforward idea. So reactive iron etching uses fluorine gas activated radio frequency power to a specific area of garium arsenide cap layer to introduce a control electrode. The garium arsenide cap layer being etched, the surface of aluminum garium arsenide can be exposed and then etching automatically stops. On the surface of aluminum garium arsenide, chemically stable aluminum fluoride develops, which inhibits further etching. So thanks to these breakthrough technologies, we finally became able to produce hemp with consistent properties repeatedly. Application models of hemp, like this, uh, uh, this is garium arsenide cap layer removed and has a gate electrode there. A hemp was uh, created out of the desire to create a high-speed device. And when it was developed, there was no market needs for hemp. Uh, but quite unexpectedly, a hemp commercialization starts to move forward. In 1983, at ISSCC a conference, International Solid State Circuit Conference, I made a presentation on the HEMS low noise four stage amplifier property, hoping it up its application for uh, microwave satellite communication. But then some members from the Radio Astronomical Observatory from the United States uh, show their interest because low noise property of, of hemmed at low temperature had a potential to replace conventional parametric amplifier and the garium arsenide MESFET amplifier. So this led to the first target of commercial development of hemmed at low noise amplifier for the radio telescope. In 1985, at Nobeyama Radio Observatory, a hemmed amplifier was installed. It contributed to the finding of unknown hydrocarbon molecules in the dark nebula, and many of the major observatories in the world introduced a hemmed telescope since then. So although the niche market, it was fortunate that a suitable market was identified early to demonstrate hemp's benefit at low temperature. 
to build more activities to other companies and as continuous improvement of device technology continue and development of new application continued. A hemp started to be popular in 1987 in place of conventional gallium, gallium uh, arsenide misfit. Uh, it was used as a low noise amplifier for the com converter of satellite broadcasting receiving system in large quantity. Low noise property enabled downsizing of parabola antennas uh, to half for the previous size so you can install in your uh, veranda. So that satellite broadcasting system became immensely popular in Japan and in Europe. It accelerated the borderless information flow. So it's almost half a century since I learned about transistors for the first time. In the hindsight, my research career was full of contingencies, twists and turns. Unexpected assignment at job, setbacks in research, fortuitous encounter with different research fields and chance meeting and conversation with other researchers at international conferences. All these contingencies, all these contingencies made me what I am today. Being able to learn something different and, in, and unexpected, one feels surprised and thrilled, and then motivated to keep up with new challenges with perseverance. It is why just an ordinary engineer like myself could develop something new which, which did not exist before. So bearing this in mind, I will continue my efforts. I would like to express my deepest appreciation to all of you who have guided and supported me. I thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now there is the presentation of flowers to Dr. Mimura. Thank you very much, Dr. Mimura.